games are interactive entertainment, meaning they require consumer participation in overcoming obstacles to get the complete experience. While all games present challenges, some games are more challenging than others. On the steeper side of the spectrum stands From Software, whose games, including Bloodborne and the Dark Souls series, have become legendary for their unforgiving difficulty. Their latest title, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, has lived up to that reputation, so much so that it forces Dark Souls veterans to unlearn many of their old habits. This has led to varied assessments of its difficulty compared to From's previous titles, with some saying it's easier, while others insist it's much harder than Dark Souls or Bloodborne. There are a few who aren't too keen on From's uncompromising difficulty. Dave Thea, a freelance writer, contributed an article to Forbes, wherein he argued, among other things, that the lack of an easy mode kept the game out of reach of players who might have enjoyed its lore, character design and world building. Players new to the game might find it easy to sympathise with him, especially so if Sekiro is their first From Software game. You face multiple enemies that hit harder, faster and absorb far more damage than you can, at least until you break their posture to get a death blow. If this was a strategy game like Age of Empires, the AI would rightly be accused of cheating. Cheating is why an easy mode is unnecessary, at least on the PC platform. Mods and trainers enable players to choose from a variety of assists, some within the bounds of the game, such as unlocking skills early, and some that break the game's challenge entirely, like infinite health and items. In short, cheats let players create their own easy mode. A journalist at PC Gamer did just that by slowing the game down to half speed. He did this because he couldn't complete the final boss battle, which is ironic considering he had written a guide for the game a while earlier. Even his guide recommended players try modding the game, though admittedly the guide was only referring to mods that unlock the frame rate, add PS4 prompt buttons and unlock widescreen resolution support. The mod he used to beat the final boss went quite a bit further, but he still felt Sekiro should have had this feature built in. A writer at Kotaku concurred with an article titled An Easy Mode Has Never Ruined a Game which argued From Software's punishing difficulty presents an insurmountable barrier for players with disabilities. Sekiro goes one step further than its precursors by not enabling you to summon other players to help you with sections you cannot complete on your own. In the absence of these crutches, the article argues an easy mode would have allowed these people to play the game. Dave's piece on Forbes goes a step further by arguing the lack of an easy mode shows a stunning lack of respect for players with the idea that they cannot be trusted with their own gameplay experience, that even those who want a challenging game would somehow be lured by the siren song of lower difficulties. He could have used Call of Duty as an example, as its easy mode doesn't devalue the game, it elevates the hardest modes. Challenge-seeking players take the trouble to grind on veteran mode, even though the game offers easier difficulties just so they can take pride in knowing I beat the game's hardest difficulty. Dave's argument boils down to this. Don't like it? Don't use it. Don't deprive the people who need it. This call for consumer choice is understandable, though it could have been argued better. This is how I'd phrase it if I had to argue on his behalf. Difficulty is like graphics. As long as the artist's vision is preserved on the higher settings, greater consumer choice can allow more people to try the game, and perhaps more importantly, buy the game. This is why accessibility is more than just artistic vision, it's a business decision. A more accessible game will appeal to more people. A larger audience translates to more revenue. However, any attempt to grow their audience with greater accessibility risks alienating the audience they already have particularly if they've built their reputation on brutal, unforgiving game design. This is why it's unlikely any future From Software title will have customizable difficulty. The Sekiro debacle has demonstrated the community would not take it well, and rightly so, they would argue. Any deviation from punishing difficulty would be perceived as a compromise in their principles. To a degree, I agree. Status quo warrior, is a term used derisively in certain circles. But I fit that description at least when it comes to game design. 
don't fix what isn't broken. If it works, don't change it. Fromm's design philosophy has certainly worked very well for them. They shouldn't have to change it unless they absolutely want to. However, that doesn't mean their games will be inaccessible, as enterprising modders will continue to enable a variety of assists, at least on the PC platform. Some developers recognize modding efforts more than others. Let's look at Soma for an example. Soma was widely praised for its story, its atmosphere and world building. However, a few players found its monsters got in the way of enjoying the game. A modder developed a solution, Wuss Mode, which didn't remove the monsters, but instead would pacify them by preventing them from attacking you. Many players praised the mod for having made the game accessible to them, and the developer, Frictional Games, noticed and acknowledged its value by incorporating a similar feature into the game, Safe Mode, to coincide with its launch on Xbox One. This addition is significant for three reasons. The developer recognized the ability of mods to help user experience beyond their deliberate design. That being said, they did think Wuss Mode felt like a cheat and differentiated their Safe Mode on this basis pitching it as a genuine way of experiencing the game. Monsters might sound and act more threatening if they spot you, so there is still an incentive of being careful. This incorporation also demonstrated mods to be a unique strength of the PC platform. The only way for console players to receive their benefits requires the developers to patch them in. This is one of the reasons single-player trainers shouldn't be frowned upon, but rather cherished. We'll go into the other reason later. The developers recognized one of their mechanics was detracting for some player's experience and gave the user a choice to opt out. Dropping a core mechanic of the game might be a touch too far for some. This raises the question, can accessibility go too far? Yes, particularly in a multiplayer game. Multiplayer titles cannot allow customizable difficulty as all players need to be playing at the same time. Therefore, there can only be one difficulty for all players. Either the artist's vision is preserved at that difficulty, or it isn't. Let's look at Guns for an example where accessibility destroyed its sequel, the publisher, and any possibility for a franchise. We've already analyzed Guns in greater detail in another video. You can watch that later if you haven't already. For now, here's a quick summary. Guns acquired a significant following due to its high skill ceiling, this was not the result of the developer's design, but a series of glitches that enabled players to quickly cancel the animations to transition from one move to the next faster than they were supposed to. These techniques were called K-Style, and coming to grips with them was incredibly addictive. This is why this 15-year-old game still has a community years after its official servers were shut down. Players who couldn't master this technique would get crushed by those who did which stunted the growth of the player base. The developers tried to make the sequel more accessible by removing animation cancelling. But in doing so, this wasn't really guns anymore. This was a different game that the developers tried to pass off as a sequel. It's possible they hoped to draw in fans of the original guns, but they didn't stick around because the feature that they played guns for was nowhere to be found. Furthermore, the title may have worked against the game by putting off anybody who had tried and failed at the first guns. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the quest for accessibility destroyed the future of guns as a game and as a franchise. For a less extreme example, let's look at League of Legends. Accessibility didn't ruin League, considering it's the most popular game in its genre today. However, it may have constrained their developer's design as they looked to make their game more accessible than Dota the mod their game took its inspiration from. Here's what Riot's VP of Game Design had to say about the ultimate ability of Bloodseeker, a hero in Dota. With Rupture in Dota, you receive a damage over time that triggers if you, the victim, choose to move. However, you have no way of knowing this is happening unless someone tells you or unless you read up on it online. So the initial response is extreme frustration. We believe that giving the victim counter gameplay is very fun, but that we should not place a burden of knowledge on them figuring out what that gameplay might be. Bloodseeker is not the only hero Riot used as an example of bad design. Here's what they had to say about Kunker's ultimate. 
the ship hits the target a bit in the future, dealing a bunch of damage and some stun to enemies. Allies, on the other hand, get damage resistance and bonus move speed, but damage mitigated comes up later. Very complicated and almost impossible to know if you have used it optimally. Do you really want your squishies getting into the area of effect? Maybe, maybe not. It's really hard to know that you've used this skill optimally and feel that you have made a clutch play because it's so hard to tell and there are so many considerations you have to make. Finally, here's what Riot's lead champion designer said about Invoker. Invoker is the pure extraction of burden of knowledge. Obviously, all champions require some knowledge to be interesting, but this is a great example of going way too far. Invoker is actually the worst example for a few reasons. Not only is he overloaded with tedious memorization and is baffling to anything but veteran players, he's actually not deep. Due to the sheer number of possible combinations, only a few are actually useful generally, but doing those requires a ritual to obtain. In short, Riot argued that the burden of knowledge hurts accessibility. But wait, you might say. This video was supposed to talk about accessibility in single-player titles. Let's look at Nier Automata for an example of a single-player game that some might say took accessibility too far. Automata's easy mode allowed the player to enable powerful assists called auto-chips to automate their designated tasks. Auto-battle and auto-shoot have the characters automatically fight and shoot for you. Move them towards enemies and the game will take care of everything. Auto evade means the characters will automatically evade incoming attacks. Something that's especially handy when energy bullets are heading right for you. Auto program takes care of your pod's special abilities, even taking care of charged attacks. Auto weapon switch will make your character automatically switch weapons when appropriate for the situation. Enable all of them at once, and the game plays itself for you. <laughs> Hilarious. Some might argue it's not too much of a game at this point. On the other hand, if this is what gaming novices need to enjoy Nier's incredible story and spellbinding soundtrack, should they be denied these options? The developer thought not, and we don't question their decisions. Nier feels like the opposite of From Software's approach allowing new players to breeze through its interactive segments while still preserving a challenge on higher difficulties. Dirt 3 is another example of extensively customizable difficulty. The easiest modes allow you to enable throttle management, which manages your car's speed for you, auto steer and corner braking, which are self-explanatory. You could turn them all off and the game could become a real challenge, especially on narrow tracks with little room for error. Fortunately, you still had a fallback even if you crashed your car. Flashbacks. These would let you rewind the race by a few seconds and resume from a point that gave you enough time to avert the accident. The catch was that you only had five flashbacks on the easiest difficulty. This limit could be disabled in Grid Autosport, Codemaster's next entry into their other franchise. Alternatively, you could disable flashbacks entirely if you wanted a challenge. Autosport was the pinnacle of customizable difficulty, in stark contrast to Codemaster's next title, Dirt Rally. Dirt Rally removed all assists at a time when players would have needed them the most. Its punishing driving model could cause more crashes in its first race than any previous Dirt did through its entire campaign. The challenge wasn't about finishing first, it was about finishing at all. If you managed to make it to the last sector but crashed a few metres before the finish line, you couldn't just rewind time for another chance. You had to restart the race from the beginning. Gone are the flashbacks that had come to define Codemasters titles for seven years. This uncompromising approach to difficulty led a couple of outlets to liken Dirt Rally to Dark Souls, though this ultimately became somewhat of a meme. The comparison does have some merit, as Dirt Rally imparts a significant degree of satisfaction in merely completing a race doubly so if you manage to scrape your way into the podium. Not that you get to see your competitors though, unless the race was a rally cross. The game didn't pit you against AI drivers, at least not in rally. Instead, you were racing against time scored by drivers you never get to see. How did they score these times? The game doesn't tell you. 
He doesn't show you how the AI drivers navigated the treacherous corners that caused so many of your crashes. Did they even have to drive? Do they even exist? You never get to see them. There are no staggered starts in the game, a major disappointment considering Dirt 3 had them. This was overlooked because the game was not a main entry into the Dirt franchise, but rather a spin-off for fans of hardcore simulations. That doesn't apply for the next title though, Dirt 4. Not only was Staggered Start still missing, you couldn't even see your competitors as ghost cars. This made Dirt 4 feel more like a recycled Dirt Rally with an easy mode rather than a true successor to Dirt 3. Even its easy mode betrayed its Dirt Rally foundation as flashbacks were still missing in Dirt 4. Good riddance, said players who liked Dirt Rally and wished to keep it that way in Dirt 4 and future sequels. As one fan put it, because it's not just an option, it's catering to those who would rather not learn. Every Dirt Grid game since the original Grid has thrown the rewind in your face every time you crash or go off track. How is something optional if the game is conditioning you to use it? Conditioning leads to the most compelling cause for concern, monetization of accessibility. When publishers see a demand for an easier experience, they will try to capitalize on it. While making the base game easier will certainly get more people to consider buying the game, this isn't necessary for franchises that don't have a reputation for being difficult. This allows them to condition the player to want an easier time while providing additional microtransactions to cash in on that accessibility. Remember, this game costs $60 to play with an additional $40 for the season pass. This is how Assassin's Creed Origins and Odyssey try to condition you towards microtransactions. You finish a main quest only to find your level is too low to start the next one. Levels play a huge role in this game, even where they shouldn't. For example, you won't be able to equip weapons if their level is higher than yours. You are Medje, protector of Egypt, trained warrior, and yet you cannot equip a weapon because of a number next to its name. Can't Ubisoft see how immersion breaking this is? As if it wasn't bad enough, this rubbish seeps into combat as you can't stealth kill an enemy whose level is considerably higher than yours. This makes no sense. You are an assassin, and yet you can't land a killing blow on an unaware target. Because of a number floating above his head? Boss battles are even worse. If you make the mistake of ignoring the level requirement, you will get destroyed in fights that feel very unfair. They can deplete two-thirds of your health in a single attack, and yet you barely make a dent in their health bars. This is not to say Assassin's Creed's are difficult. They are tedious. They are tedious for a reason, and not a good one. You are meant to grind side missions and other activities to get your level up to the threshold before you can continue the main storyline. Except, after all those hours you spent grinding side missions, you will have forgotten where you left the main storyline. You can avoid this problem by purchasing time savers, like a permanent boost to cut your grind in half. As said in the previous video, why does our time need to be saved in the first place? This is Ubisoft admitting that the grind was designed solely to waste our time. If you're going to sell time savers, what will they cost? Boosts don't cost money, they cost Helix credits, a virtual currency that serves to obfuscate the cost of game items and time savers. It does this by using a different cost for each Helix credit pack. The $5 pack gives you 100 credits per dollar. The $10 pack gives you 105 credits per dollar. The $20 pack gives you 120 credits per dollar. The $35 pack gives you 131.428 credits per dollar. And the $50 pack gives you 148 credits per dollar. Which of these values are you supposed to use to calculate the true price of time savers? Adding their costing credits amounts to 5,700 credits. That's worth $38.50 to $57, depending on the credit pack you buy. The former is more applicable as the $50 pack is needed to buy all time savers at once. It gets more complicated as you will have 1,700 credits left over. Only a few items like the boosts have costs that line up with the cheaper packs. The XP and currency boosts cost two $5 packs each, while the boosts for both cost three $5 packs. 
The virtual currency is also a sinister attempt to condition you into forgetting you're spending real money on boosts in a single-player game. You're not paying to skip. You're buying Helix credits for cosmetics. Hmm, that XP boost looks useful. I think I'll drop some Helix credits on that. Ah, oh, crap. I'm out of credits. Well, I have some, but not enough to unlock anything. Better top them up. Be ashamed to let them go to waste. Better buy some credits again. Let me get my credit card. What if you didn't need to? What if you could get those boosts for free? Turns out you can, or at least on the PC platform. This is why the stigma around trainers is counterproductive to consumer interests. Sure, they may be cheats, but this is single player. They provide a valuable free alternative to exploitative business models. How, you might ask? Let's continue with Assassin's Creed for our first example. Say the grind has worn you down, but you still want to finish the story you bought the game for. Do you feel comfortable paying $10 to $15 for an XP boost? Or would you rather press Alt-1? Would you rather pay $15 for 15 ability points? Or would you rather type 15 in the trainer and press 6 on the number pad? If you're short on drachmas, the in-game currency, would you like to buy 11,000 for $10? Or would you rather type the amount you need into the trainer and press 4 on the number pad? Assassin's Creed is not the only franchise that forces this dilemma. Let's look at Deus Ex, another franchise that had its latest title corrupted this way. Mankind Divided. $5 could buy you an assault pack, which gave you a custom skinned battle rifle, two packs of regular battle rifle ammo, one pack of armor-piercing battle rifle ammo, two frag grenades, two EMP grenades, 500 weapon parts, and one Praxis kit, using the included chaff augmentation to give you a few extra seconds to escape the proximity of nearby explosives. Alternatively, if you preferred a stealthy approach, that $5 could instead be spent on a tactical pack, which gives you a custom-skinned tranquilizer rifle, the micro-assembler augmentation, one pack of tranquilizer ammo, three smoke grenades and two gas grenades. These microtransactions just push players towards piracy. How, you might ask? The scene considers these packs DLC and releases cracks for them. While players who bought the game are asked to pay again for these packs, pirates get to use both without spending a dime. This is not the only convenience that can be obtained for free. If you are short on in-game currency, you could download a trainer and press its designated key. A few even allow you to set the amount of currency you want. But if that makes you uncomfortable, you could spend $1 on a pack of 1,000 additional credits, providing you with extra spending money to purchase Praxis kits, ammo, weapons, or anything else you may find at the shops in Deus Ex Mankind Divided. That $1 could instead be spent on one Praxis kit, which activates one augmentation for use in combat. Alternatively, you could just press another button on the trainer to get more Praxis kits than you'd ever need. Deus Ex is old news, some might say. Mankind Divided was released in 2016. It's irrelevant now. Well, let's look at a more recent game for our final example. Devil May Cry 5. For $20, you can buy a million red orbs, which, as the page puts it, can be used in Devil May Cry 5 to acquire new skills and power up your characters, as well as letting you go back into the battle after you lose. If $20 feels excessive, you can buy a tenth of it for a tenth of the price. There is no discount for purchasing in bulk. $2 gets you 100,000 red orbs. That $2 could instead be spent on three blue orbs, each of which will increase your maximum health gauge by one segment. Alternatively, you don't have to spend a penny if you're on the PC, as you can just download a trainer and press a button to get far more orbs than you could by purchasing microtransactions. If you play in a console though, you might be out of luck, as the store might be your only option. This might be why publishers continue pushing microtransactions on the PC. They're effective on the consoles, and it's trivial to port the store to the PC to skim some additional revenue off players new to the PC platform and don't know any better. This is what journalists who clamor for an easy mode in Sekiro should understand. Be careful what you wish for. You just might get it for a price.
Sekiro contains all the RPG elements that have been monetized in Devil May Cry, Deus Ex and Assassin's Creed. Sure, From Software would never stoop so low. But Activision? This is a company that tried to sell a red dot site for real money. This is a company that held back on microtransactions at launch, just so they wouldn't factor into the reviews and consequently avoided putting people off buying Black Ops 4 only to add them later once everyone had purchased the product. Does anyone think Activision is above selling accessibility in a game after its launch? No. With that said, there is an interesting case where another company went the other way by monetizing difficulty. Metro Last Light. The game's hardest difficulty makes enemies tougher and increases the scarcity of ammunition, which can also be used as currency in the Metro world. Ranger Mode, as this was called, was sold separately for $5, which the publisher's brand manager justified as the lowest first parties would permit us to charge for content of this nature. You could avoid paying that extra $5 by pre-ordering the game for a free upgrade to the limited edition. The difficulty mode is included in all copies of the initial manufacturing run. While a pre-order guarantees this limited edition, it is not a requirement. So, on disc DLC, the limited edition also granted an exclusive in-game weapon and 100 military-grade bullets only for the Ranger mode. The Ranger mode was advertised as DLC, experience complete immersion. No HUD, less bullets, brutal combat. The way it was meant to be played. Why then was it not included for all players? This was the question PC Gamer put to the publisher. The Affirmation brand manager had this reply. Game makers and publishers now live in a world where offering game content as a pre-order exclusive is a requirement by retail, and Ranger mode seemed like the best choice since it was a mode for hardcore fans who would most likely pre-order the game or purchase it at launch in any case. We rejected requests to make story content or additional missions exclusive. We also rejected requests to make this a timed exclusive. Was this a good enough justification? Is selling harder difficulty better or worse than game selling time savers? Let us know in the comment section below. And that concludes our analysis of accessibility in video games. If you like this video, please share it. There is more content like this on the way, so please like, subscribe and press the bell button so you don't miss out. While you're here, feel free to watch our playlist on Denuvo's history and performance impact and our hardware analysis of CPUs and GPUs. Do you play Rainbow Six Siege or Dota 2? Check out the other channel for analytical guides for both games. Link is in the description and on the screen. This will also serve as our secondary channel, so please subscribe even if you don't play these games.